All right, so let's get back into this. So we had been talking about religion and its connection to slavery systems. And I do want to say really quickly before we move on here, that it isn't that religion um, was some sort of grand conspiracy to try and prop up slavery systems or anything like that. Um, you just have to remember that when we think about what shapes the way people understand their world, religion often does that. People's faith and their beliefs are, are one of the most foundational things that help shape the way people understand what the world is and should or could be. And so when there are particular worldviews that you already hold, like it's acceptable to own other human beings, we tend to look towards our faith and towards other philosophical ideas that will confirm what we already believe to be true. Um, so it isn't necessarily that religion is built to do this. It's rather that human beings tend to use what we can to justify what we already want to do. So <clears throat> we talked about a little bit about how these ideas about the visible manifestation of sin and difference showing up in conceptions about slavery and about how it spreads into uh, Judeo-Christian and Islamic worlds. And Spain and Portugal, of all of the European kingdoms, was were the first places to really have contact with the notion of not just visible difference in slavery, but visible difference in slavery being connected to sub-Saharan African populations. And that was largely because if you think about Western Europe, the only places where Muslims lived in great numbers during the 13 and 1400s was southern Spain, um, the southern reaches of the Portuguese uh, kingdom. Um, and so they had the greatest amount of contact with these Islamic ideas that had developed connecting sort of the Judeo-Christian notion of visible manifestation of sin and connecting it to sub-Saharan African populations. And so therefore, Spain and Portugal are going to be the first, but definitely not the last, European kingdoms to incorporate these ideas and to blend them together into this giant ball of terribleness. So what we start to see is the practice of race-based slavery emerging for the first time in the Iberian Peninsula, that is Spain and Portugal in the early part of the 15th century, the early 1400s. So, oh, sorry. We also have to contextualize this with what was going on in Western Europe at the time. So at the same time that these ideas about race-based slavery were emerging into Western Europe, you also had fewer and fewer Western Europeans who were being involved themselves in forced labor. Now, forced labor, like we have discussed in slavery in general, was widespread in the pre-modern world. And there were lots of different forms of it. People could be forced into serfdom. So being a serf is different from being a slave because you're not property and you're not bought or sold. Um, <clears throat> but what you are is tied to the land. You're not ever allowed to leave. Um, you're not free, but you're also not enslaved. Um, then you could be an indentured servant where you didn't get paid for your labor, but that term was limited. And after a certain period of time, you were allowed to go free. But labor practices started to change in Western Europe following the Black Death. And I alluded to this last unit, that what you had was a decline in the population of Western Europe that was so severe that farmers and tenant farmers and laborers were able to go to the people to whom they might have been an indentured servant before and basically said, look, you need me. There aren't enough people to build the bridge. There aren't enough people to herd the sheep. You have to pay me for my work now. And so what you start to see is a transformation towards wage labor in Western Europe during the Renaissance. So at the same time that Western Europeans, especially Spaniards and Portuguese populations, were starting to internalize this idea as slavery being tied to sin, being tied to sub-Saharan Africans, you also have the limitation of, of enslavement of Western Europeans and forced labor of Western Europeans in Western Europe. And so what happens is slave ownership now in Western Europe becomes a matter of status, becomes a way of showing that you're wealthy, that you're powerful. 
And so in order to show that power, what you wanted, what people wanted was to be able to immediately have identifiable slaves, have people who were identifiable by their condition of enslavement. And that meant that they needed to be distinctly, visually distinct and different from European populations. And thus, the differential of skin color becomes something of a marker, a status symbol. I mentioned yesterday that Queen Isabella of Castile, the one who said that all indigenous people were gente de razón, they were people of reason, right? They were capable of independent thought and therefore they couldn't be enslaved. She owned slaves. She owned a hundred or more slaves. They were all African. And this was a justification thing for her. She believed that it was acceptable because people who she owned as slaves were already visibly marked as sinful. She believed that this was acceptable unto God. Um, I disagree most strongly with her. Plus, in Spain, there was already a tradition that non-Spanish and non-Catholic people had very few rights and privileges. The same year that Columbus landed in the Americas, was the same year that the Spanish completed what was called the Reconquista of Spain, the Reconquest of Spain. And this was the notion that Christian Spaniards were going to retake the Iberian Peninsula and kick out non-Christian populations. And this included the sizable Muslim population, especially in southern Spain, and the Jewish population. This was carried out by the medieval Catholic Church and then later by the Renaissance Catholic Church, and it involved essentially ex expelling people from their homelands and seizing their property. And if they would not go peaceably, they were often tortured or even put to death. This also occurred in 1492, and to my mind, in a lot of ways, was the bigger story in 1492 than Columbus's discovery. I mean, not like on a grand historical like worldview, but in Spain in 1492, the big story was the expulsion of Jewish and Muslim populations. So <clears throat> there was already this notion that it was acceptable to treat people who were different in some way in Spain from normal Spaniards. And so this meant that it was kind of already built into the legal system that you could deny certain rights and privileges to certain categories of people on the basis of sin. So this gets combined with those sort of racist ideas about sin being tied to sub-Saharan African populations because they were visibly different from Europeans and visibly different from Islamic populations for the most part. Now, <clears throat> all of that is the backstory. Because while these ideas are percolating in the background and making their way into people's brains, and people are thinking, yes, this justifies what I already believed, over in the Americas, the Americas are being colonized initially by Spain, by Portugal. Um, some of the, the French explorers are just starting to get moving over there. The English will take a bit longer, so will the Dutch. But the Americas were being found to be a great place for agriculture. And in particular, there were several crops that were highly desirable, not just by domestic American uh, cons consumers, but also by European and even Asian consumers. And those included products like tobacco, rice, sugar, silver, and gold. Now, with the exception of rice there, none of those things are required for life. Like, you can get by without tobacco or sugar or silver or gold. So... <clears throat> What this means is that these are crops or products that are being produced not because they're necessary, but because they're desirable. These are luxury goods. And all of these goods require insanely difficult work. Um, they are incredibly dangerous jobs. Um, sugar production sounds like it's really, really easy, but it's not. Um, sugar comes from sugar cane, and if you have never had it before, it is delicious raw. But in order to cut it, you have to use a machete. You have to use a, a single-bladed, um, very long knife, essentially, that you swing. Um, basically, you pull it all the way back, 
to the level of your shoulder and then you swing downward at an angle to cut through the kind of like thick almost wood like stalks of sugarcane. Now the thing is in order to do this you usually kind of put one leg out so that you can kind of move your whole body and swing all the way through. But that means that if you miss or you fail to stop the blade of the machete you will usually hit your leg directly on your thigh which means you sever your femoral artery and bleed out in about 30 seconds. So harvesting the sugar cane itself is really difficult but once you cut the cane it's game on. You have basically 36 hours to do your job or the sugarcane becomes unusable. So the next thing you have to do, you take the stalks of sugarcane and you have to crush out the juice. This means you have these giant rolling gears that roll towards each other. But as of the 15 and 1600s, they had not yet invented reversible gears. That means that once a gear started to move inward, you could not back it back out. And you had to feed in these stalks of sugarcane by hand. And if your hand got trapped, you either had to cut off your arm or the whole body went through the gears and you died. I am not exaggerating this. This is documented in a ton of different sources. Then once you have crushed out the juice of the cane, generally speaking, what you had to do was boil it, but on a low temperature and stirring it consistently for up to 12 hours straight. That means you could not stop because it would scald at the bottom and ruin the sugar. Then once it's into a thick syrupy concoction, then you have to pour it into the molds, flip the molds over and let them cool slowly. This had to happen within 36 hours. The work was excruciating. People didn't sleep during sugar harvesting season. And even when it wasn't harvest season, the work was uh, unending. Um, People who worked on sugar plantations generally had a life expectancy of 23 years max. That is how exploitative it was. Plus, you add to that the notion that here are these crops that are so valuable in Western Europe, sugar, tobacco, rice, all of these sort of things. The indigenous workforce, like we discussed yesterday, was shrinking due to disease, people fleeing, um, people resisting the encomienda system and due to the changing legal system. Remember, I told you about Bartolome de las Casas yesterday, the guy who fought to get legal rights for indigenous people and protections for them? Well, his work was really great for the indigenous population. It was terrible for African populations because this drove European colonists to look other places for labor. And so Africa became the target. And the reason Africa becomes the target is because there were already slave trading networks that connected Europe and Africa. Remember that Trans-Saharan trade network we, we talked about? Like, that is still a thing. People are still trading across the Sahara, and they are still trading enslaved people. Africans were agriculturalists broadly. They knew how to produce rice and cultivate sugar. They were already doing this. They had the skills. They were less likely to die of diseases than Amerindians because they had been exposed to domesticated animals in a way that indigenous people in the Americas hadn't. And there were tons of justifications that people told themselves made this action acceptable. There were all of those excuses about religion, about philosophy, about race, that people had made up for themselves to make them feel better about what they were doing to other humans. Like this is just a quick rule, I tend to think in terms of human history, but if you have to come up with systems that are that complicated to try and justify your actions, you know they're wrong. You know they're wrong. If you've got to do that much moral tap dancing, then there's something wrong with what you're doing. So, these are sort of the ideas that lead to this. This is what we call the transatlantic slave trade. And you can see <coughs> that you have enslaved people being brought primarily from the western coast of Africa, but not exclusively. There were people who were stolen from their homes in eastern Africa, who were stolen from Madagascar, um, who were then shipped across the Atlantic, and then they were sold into a number of different locales. Now, you will notice, if you look at those arrows, you will see that the bulk of the population went 
here to the West Indies, usually to Cuba. And then that acted as like sort of a clearinghouse and populations either stayed in the Caribbean or they were shipped off elsewhere. Very few people actually were sent directly from the West Coast of Africa into the United States. We'll talk about why in the next little video. And you can see here that a huge number of people were sold directly into Brazil. Now, I'm going to talk in just a moment about what happened to these people when they got there um, and how we know what they what they went through. Um, so bear with me. I have one more video on this topic. I know it's a lot, but it's important.